operative instructions so and we have once we have completed doing the pac we have to do give some pre operative instructions to the surgeons so that we can optimize the patient and prepare the patient for the surgery in the pre operative instruction the first and the foremost important thing is writing the npo orders npo or nil per oral nil per oral orders so what are the npo guidelines the npo guidelines are 2 hours for clear fluids 2 hours for clear fluids what does the word clear fluids mean clear fluids are water uh, fruit juices without pulp clear black tea okay all these are clear fluids then it is 4 hours for breast milk 4 hours for breast milk then it is 6 hours for formula feed 6 hours for formula feed or any semi solid food or any semi solid food semi solid food then it is 8 hours for a fatty meal eight if you have if you eat mutton then it is fatty meal 8 hours for a fatty meal this was a previous previous year question np orders very important one question from this for sure then we need to do some drug modifications we need to do some drug modifications drug modification so we need to order some changes in the uh, patient currently using drugs okay for drugs patient currently is using patient is currently on patient is currently on medications okay beginning with antihypertensives antihypertensive these are the most commonly used antihypertensives you have to continue all the antihypertensives on day of surgery continue on day of surgery continue on day of surgery that means till day of surgery okay continue on until day of surgery with one exception except ACE inhibitors and ARBs you have to you should not continue angiotensin receptor blockers ACE inhibitors and ARB, ARBs you have to stop 24 hours before surgery stop 24 hours before surgery why because they can cause postural hypotension they, there are cases reported that they caused postural hypotension so ACE inhibitors and ARBs are discontinued 24 hours before surgery then the next oral hypoglycemic agents or anti glycemic oral hypoglycemic agents or insulins oral hypoglycemic agents or insulins or insulins skip all the oral hypoglycemic agents and short acting insulins on day of surgery skip all OHAs oral hypoglycemic agents and short acting insulins short in acting insulins short acting insulins on day of surgery on day of surgery on day of surgery skip SGLT2 inhibitors or discontinue SGLT2 inhibitors 24 hours before surgery discontinue SGLT2 inhibitors 24 hours before surgery 24 hours before surgery these are the recommendations these are the recommendations and if the patient is on a long acting or intermediate acting insulin if patient is on long or intermediate acting insulin depending upon whether he is a type 1 diabetic or type 2 diabetic if the patient is a type 2 diabetic give half of the dose of insulin on the morning 
give half of the dose of the insulin and if the patient is type 1 diabetic mellitus give one third of the dose before surgery give one third of the dose one third of the dose on day of surgery all right moving on if the patient is on anti epileptic drugs anti epileptic drugs known case of epilepsy he is on anti epileptic drugs continue continue till day of surgery continue all anti epileptic drugs continue on day of surgery continue on day of surgery if the patient is on any thyroid medications patient is on thyroid medications whether it be anti thyroid drugs or thyroxin supplementation thyroid drugs whether supplements or anti thyroid drugs you have to continue till the day of surgery anti thyroid drugs continue if the patient is a known case of schizophrenia then patient is on anti psychotics anti psychotics or anti depressant drugs anti psychotics or anti depressants continue till day of surgery continue till day of surgery and there is an exception is tricyclic antidepressants stop tricyclic antidepressants 3 weeks before surgery 3 weeks before surgery all right then there is lithium stop lithium 24 to 48 hours before surgery stop 24 to 48 hours before surgery 24 to 48 hours prior to surgery if it is just a minor surgery or a low risk surgery you may sometimes continue but the guideline recommendation is stop 24 to 48 hours prior to surgery then cardiac medications if the patient is on anticoagulation anticoagulation therapy anticoagulants there is guidelines called astra guidelines american society of regional anesthesia guidelines are there so aspirin aspirin you need to stop 72 hours before surgery stop 72 hours before surgery except except the if the patient is having a recent mi or a recent stroke or a recent cva or a recent coronary stenting then you can continue asa or aspirin except for recent coronary stenting stenting recent stroke recent mi you can continue aspirin all right then we have clopidogrel then we have clopidogrel stop clopidogrel 5 days before surgery 5 days before surgery then we have ticlopidin then we have ticlopidin it is usually stopped at 10 days before surgery the new new recommendations is 10 days prior to surgery 10 days prior to surgery stop 10 days prior to surgery then we have warfarin warfarin which is an anticoagulant it should be stopped 5 days before surgery stop 5 days before surgery then we have ticagrelor ticagrelor stop 7 5 to 7 days before surgery stop 5 to 7 days before surgery then we have prasugrel stop 7 to 10 days before surgery stop 7 to 10 days before surgery okay then we have apixaban stop 26 to 30 hours before surgery 26 to 30 hours before surgery 
then we have at 6 map stop 24 to 48 hours before surgery stop 24 to 48 hours before surgery then we have then we have iptifibatide or tirofiban iptifibatide or tirofiban stop 4 to 8 hours 4 to 8 hours before surgery Then we have rivaroxaban, rivaroxaban, or dabigatran, or dabigatran. Stop them 72 hours before surgery. Stop 72 hours before surgery. All right. Then we have the low molecular weight heparin. Then we have low molecular weight heparin the person may be using the low molecular weight heparin for a prophylactic purpose or a therapeutic purpose so if the person is using it for prophylaxis for dvt prophylaxis for prophylaxis then stop it 12 hours before surgery 12 hours before surgery then if it if he is using for a therapeutic purpose for treatment pur purpose then stop 24 hours before surgery because the dosage is also varied depending upon the use then if the person is using unfractionated heparin if the person is using unfractionated heparin again if he is using for profile axis for profile axis you need to stop 4 to uh, 6 hours before surgery four to six hours before surgery. If he is using for treatment purposes, for treatment purposes, then you need to stop eight to 12 hours before surgery. Eight to 12 hours before surgery. All right. And if the patient is using for treatment purposes, eight to 12 hours before surgery, if the person is taking it by on subcutaneous route. And if the person is taking it on IV route, then again, four to six hours before surgery. Four to six hours before surgery. All right. So these are the treatment or anticoagulation guidelines, which are also very important. These might be asked in the examination. Then moving on, moving on. If the patient is having a coronary stent placed, if the patient, if patient has The patient has a coronary revascularization done. Coronary revascularization. Coronary revascularization or stenting. Or stenting. So depending upon the type of stent, we need to defer the surgery. So if it is a bare metal stent, if it is a bare metal stent, bare metal stent, you can wait for one month wait for one month or four weeks one month if it is a drug eluting stent if it is a drug eluting stent then you need to wait for six months one month and six months okay wait for six months now if a female patient is on hormone replacement therapy or she is taking oral contraceptive pills, how is the drug modification? If she is taking hormone replacement therapy, estrogen therapy, hormone replacement therapy, the therapy has to be stopped 4 to 8 weeks before surgery. 4 to 8 weeks, some recommendations say it is 4 weeks. But four to eight weeks before surgery, the therapy has to be stopped before surgery because high doses of estrogen will increase the risk of thromboembolism. High estrogen increases risk of thromboembolism. Is this clear? If the patient is on OCP, 
or high dose oral contraceptive pills then they have to be stopped 4 weeks before surgery 4 weeks before surgery some people say if until and unless there is a high risk of dvt there is no need of stopping ocps but we recommend if there is a high dose of estrogen or ocps are being taken better to stop 4 weeks before surgery all right then we have herbal medications any herbal medication even those having combinations of ginger garlic or even green tea has to be stopped 7 days before surgery has to be stopped 7 days before surgery stopped 7 days before surgery one day previously the recommendation was two weeks now it is seven days seven days before surgery this also includes your green tea then if the patient is on diuretics any kidney disease patient or a heart patient if she is on di diuretics they have to be stopped they have to be stopped 24 hours prior to surgery 24 hours prior to surgery there is one exception even in the, the diuretics which is thiazide diuretics thiazide diuretics because these can cause lesser hypotension lesser hypotension so they may be continued so they may be continued thiazide diuretics okay then we have sildenafil Sildenafil, if a person is on regular Sildenafil, which comes under brand name Viagra, this has to be stopped at least 24 hours prior to surgery. Stopped 24 hours prior to surgery because there is a risk of hypotension with Sildenafil. There is a risk of hypotension. Understood? Moving on. Some people are on NSAIDs, people keep taking NSAIDs for knee pain, back pain, everything, any pain, take NSAIDs. Okay. You have to discontinue NSAIDs 24 to 48 hours before surgery. Discontinue NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Discontinue 24 to 48 hours before the surgery. 28 to 48 hours before the surgery. Then there are certain drugs which have to be continued. If the patient is on statins, patient is on asthma medication, patient is on any acid reflux drugs, acid reflux medications, any eye drops, any topical ointments, all these can be continued. All these can be continued even on the day of surgery. All these can be continued. And then there are some patients who are on steroids. Patients who are on prednisolone, hydrocortisone. Okay. If the patient is on prednisolone, the HPA axis is altered. The hypothalamo pituitary axis. The hypothalamo pituitary axis. Whether it is suppressed or not. Okay. How we will know if the HPA axis is not suppressed? First scenario is if the HPA axis is not suppressed. Not suppressed in the sense the patient is taking a dose of less than 5 mg of prednisolone. That is patient taking patient taking less than 5 mg of prednisolone. Less than 5 mg of prednisolone. Or he is taking the steroid for a duration for a duration less than three weeks for a duration less than three weeks here the HPA axis is not suppressed okay in this condition we can continue the same regimen what is being used by the person continue same continue same regimen okay the second case scenario if HPA axis is suppressed, if HPA axis is suppressed, 
how you know if the patient is taking patient is taking prednisolone prednisolone 20 mg per day 20 mg per day for a duration of more than 3 weeks duration for duration more than 3 weeks 3 weeks more than 3 weeks then here in this case the hp axis is suppressed in this case you have to supplement with extra steroid then you need steroidal supplementation supplementation with hydrocortisone supplementation with hydrocortisone okay i hope this is clear then some patients are on anti tubercular therapy patients are on anti tubercular therapy therapy or att if the liver function tests are normal you can continue continue if liver function tests or lfts are normal then if the patient is on anticholinesterases like neostigmine myasthenia gravis all these patients okay if the patient is on anticholinesterases anticholinesterases then you can continue then you can continue in decreased doses then you can continue then you can continue the dr drug in the decreased doses if the patient is a smoker when will you ask the patient to quit smoking he has to quit forever actually but for the care, for the concept of surgery we ask the patient asked to quit smoking for 6 to 8 weeks 6 to 8 weeks prior to surgery you ask the patient to quit smoking for 6 to 8 weeks prior to surgery if the patient is a chronic alcoholic he has to stop it at least 24 hours before surgery stop at least 24 hours prior to surgery 24 hours prior to surgery but patient might get withdrawal uh, effects of the withdrawal of alcohol like he, he might land up in seizures okay so we usually give librium on the night of surgery the, on the day before surgery okay if the patient is on withdrawal medications already withdrawal meds already if the patient is on disulfiram patient is on disulfiram Stop 10 days before surgery. 10 days before surgery. And if the patient is on methadone, patient is on methadone, continue, continue maintenance doses. Continue maintenance doses. Continue maintenance doses. And if the patient is on naltrexone, patient is on naltrexone, 72 hours before surgery. Stop naltrexone 20, 72 hours before surgery. Alright. If the patient had an upper respiratory tract infection, upper respiratory tract infection, he had cold, cough, sore throat, there was a pharyngitis. Okay. If the patient had pharyngitis, wait for up to 4 weeks. You can defer elective surgery for up to one month if the patient has an upper respiratory tract infection because it will take a long time to heal. It will take a long time to heal the mucociliary clearance and everything. The patient has increased WBCs, leukocytes. The patient is now immunity has been reduced. So the wound healing and all will be difficult for the patient even after the surgery. So it is better to defer the surgery for at least four weeks. Then if the then you are doing a PIC and one patient came saying that uh, he had COVID-19 history in the past. Who doesn't have COVID-19 history? Everybody has. So if a patient with COVID-19, COVID-19 affected patient came, 
covid 19 affected patient so depending upon the how symptomatic the patient was so if the patient had <clears throat> mild symptoms patient had mild symptoms then consider it as a upper respiratory tract infection and wait for 4 weeks defer the surgery for 4 weeks if the patient was admitted in icu if the patient was admitted in icu <clears throat> then you can defer an elective surgery for 12 weeks these are the guideline recommendations okay if the patient is admitted in icu defer the surgery for 12 weeks <clears throat> And if the patient said that I just vaccinated sir when I can undergo a hernia surgery or a hydrocyl surgery. If the patient is vaccinated, wait for at least two weeks. Wait for at least two weeks after final dose. Wait for at least two weeks after the final dose. Okay. Is this clear? <clears throat> These are the drug modifications. After you write all the drug modifications, you write the NP orders, then the most importantly, you have to take an informed or written consent, <coughs> written consent from the patient. Then you give a local anesthetic sensitivity testing, local anesthetic sensitivity testing for or for lignocaine or xylocaine or lignocaine. Then you also have to reassure the patient in the PAC itself about the surgery. Reassurance will relieve the anxiety of the patient to a certain extent. Reassurance to relieve anxiety. All right. Then after this, let's just discuss in brief about the pre-medication. Okay pre-medication what pre-medication do you give to the patient before surgery <clears throat> benzodiazepines benzodiazepines we have midazolam we have midazolam then we have diazepam then we have diazepam why we are giving these drugs for anxiolysis for anxiolysis but before giving diazepam as a, or uh, midazolam as a pre-medication you must be conscious in some patients be cautious be cautious while administering it to a patient with patient who is a geriatric patient or older patient then for children and a patient with head injury with a low GCS already head injury so just to be cautious then anticholinergics we administer anticholinergics what is the function of anticholinergics to decrease secretions to reduce oral secretions what anticholinergics are being used? Atropine. But the properties of atropine are it can cross the blood brain barrier. Atropine can cross blood brain barrier. It has a more vagolytic action than glycopyrrolate. It is more vagolytic. More vagolytic than glycopyrrolate. More vagolytic. The vagolytic property is more than anti-secretory property for atropine. Then we have glycopyrrolate, which is most commonly used as an anticholinergic pre-medication. We have glycopyrrolate. Glycopyrrolate properties are it is a quaternary amine. It is a quaternary amine. Unlike atropine, it does not cross blood brain barrier. Does not cross blood brain barrier. It does not cause sedation. Does not have, does not cause sedation. 
then it has a greater anti secretory or anti psilogog effect than atropine greater anti secretory or anti psilogog effects anti psilogog effect than atropine than atropine <clears throat> then we also have another drug which is scopolamine which is not used regularly scopolamine <clears throat> it crosses the blood brain barrier scopolamine crosses blood brain barrier one second scopolamine causes crosses the blood brain barrier i hope this is clear then what more drugs we give we give anti emetics we give anti emetic drugs we give anti emetic drugs to reduce the sensation of nausea and to decrease the chances of vomiting to reduce nausea and vomiting what drugs you do use commonly we use ondansetron which is a 5ht3 antagonist then cetron we use dexamethasone which is a steroid dexamethasone dexamethasone then what else we administer antibiotics the prophylactic antibiotics is required antibiotic antibiotic is usually given 45 minutes before the incision 45 minutes to 1 hour before 45 minutes to 1 hour before the surgical incision before surgical incision then to decrease the risk of aspiration in certain cases we also administer certain drugs especially in case of an emergency surgery or if a pregnant patient has to be posted for general anesthesia we usually give anti aspiration prophylaxis okay <clears throat> anti aspiration not for all the patients for patients with high risk of aspiration high risk of aspiration that is pregnant females posted for ga pregnant females patients who are full stomach full stomach patients came for an emergency surgery full stomach patients who came for an emergency surgery all right so what drugs we use metoclopramide metoclopramide then we also have sodium citrate sodium citrate which is a liquid sodium citrate in liquid form we give 30 ml 0.3 m molar concentration of sodium citrate around 30 minutes before surgery 30 minutes before surgery or we can do riles tube aspiration also you can put a riles and aspirate riles is an isogastric tube as you know riles tube aspiration okay sometimes we also give something called a preemptive analgesia that is a pain relief preemptive analgesia it is a part of multimodal analgesia preemptive analgesia also okay so this is a this is about the preoperative instructions we give give we give before the surgery uh, and recently like from the topics which we have done in the previous video and this video recently there was a question asked in the recent fmg about some hair removal of the patient whether it has to be done using a razor or a clipper so the nice guideline or the recommendation for part preparation is that hair removal hair removal needs to be done on the day of surgery removal needs to be done on day of surgery on day of surgery 
and if the question comes whether it is a clipper or a razor a clipper should be used clipper should be used razor is avoided and the razor should be avoided these are the guidelines and ironically this question came in the examination all right and also there was one more question recently i think it came in in set they are they asked to calculate the metabolic equivalence they gave the oxygen consumption and calculate the and asked to calculate the metabolic equivalence metabolic equivalence patient consumed 1500 ml of oxygen per minute in the and they were asking for metabolic equivalence so we already know that one metabolic equivalent is nothing but oxygen consumption or basal oxygen consumption of 3.5 ml per kg per minute we have already learned this now for a 70 kg man for a 70 kg man it comes to around 250 ml per minute 250 ml per minute so if you want to calculate the metabolic equivalence you have to divide the basal uh, we have you have to divide the given oxygen consumption the total oxygen consumption given oxygen consumption by the basal oxygen consumption given oxygen consumption by basal oxygen consumption all right which comes to around 1500 divided by 250 which is 6 so the answer is 6 metabolic equivalents all right so this was the previous question <clears throat> so i think we are clear with all the pre operative instructions and the npo orders the most important from the video is npo orders and the drug modifications in the previous video malampati grading is the most important question that is very repeatedly being asked in every uh, every entrance examination so yeah if you like the video drop a like subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed yet and there is a telegram link given in the description below you can go to the telegram link we'll be posting the uh, slides of these presentations in the telegram group so you can follow us in the telegram group and also don't forget to follow us in instagram channel under the name anesthesia notes all right so all the best for your examinations take care